those areas will find high growth of one site uh, type of plant or a large variety of plants. This makes good cover for different animals such as deer, foxes, as well as the birds. This kind of a site allows the animal to stay hidden while they move from one spot to another, transitioning from one environment to the other. So these are good areas to be looking for tracks, as well as looking for areas to set traps. Squirrels often will find a high rise in the forest, roots, rocks, or logs. That's where they like to come up and they'll feast. The reason being is they can get a good view of their perimeters. They'll sit up there and they'll munch away and here they've been chewing on some hazels. Up on this cedar root, there's a lot of it. All the way back to here, they just throw it back in a midden pile. There's some up the front, here, here, and here. And there's even some from last season, right there. And this is red squirrel country, so we know that this is going to be a red squirrel more likely than anything else. And the cracks being almost half right in half is almost typical with red squirrel as well as some versions of woodpecker, some varieties of woodpecker. Whereas with a mouse, they would almost bore, this one's almost like a mouse, they bore only in one place and they chew everything out, kind of like that one. But this is definitely a crack open from the squirrel. From there, you can see scratching marks right up here, scuffed up here as well. But a very fresh one much lower down here on the root. And that's actually a territorial marker as well as them getting in there trying to get to the cambium layer of the cedar which is high in vitamin C and nutritional value to them. So this is a very big indicator of squirrel and that can be used to our advantage to set a trap. In fact, if we wanted to use the laziness of a squirrel against it, we can set a pole here from the root down to the basic ground and set snares and a coil around it, more or less on the top since it's so low to the ground. And they'll run up, get snagged in it, and as long as you've got a planted good in the ground or use a heavy stick, they're not going to be able to get away with it. And even if they do, they'll leave a big trail you can follow and easily catch them. So that's a good indicator. This is a beaver site, obviously. So the obviousness is very clear to anybody that's tracked or seen how a beaver works. They just come in, and they'll bite, and they'll bite, and they'll rip the chunk out. Bite, and they'll bite, and they'll rip the chunk out, and they'll knock down this dogwood. And they're working on this birch tree a few months back. They haven't come back. Something probably spooked them or they gave up on it. There's more happening here than just that. Let me adjust my leg so I'm a little bit more comfortable while I explain this. Here, beaver's been coming up and we can see all this rich, thick, very pungent mud from the bottom of the water. And we know it's from the bottom of the water. One trick is, if I can keep myself balanced, if I can touch it, I get very little residue. It's been washed clean of most of its actual dirt. It's very thick on its own. Usually this was from up in the forest mud. Touch it, I'll have a really big dark stain on my fingers up in the Carolinian woods. So this is mud from the bottom of the water. It's been mulched up and all the bacteria have eaten up all the nutri nutrients, which is why it's so clean on my fingers. They're pulling it up with their bellies and everything else while they walk up. And they're actually scooping it up and making a pile like the one right here. And what happens there is they spray their caster from their glands as a marker. Now, there's two things that are interesting, interesting about that. First is, the forest here is just astoundingly beautiful. You have all this rich diversity here. We're finding deer tracks, fox tracks. We're finding snapping turtle nests where otters are sliding around, and now beaver. Now, beaver is a keystone animal for a lot of marshways. If you're finding beaver, you're finding a fairly natural and healthy environment. Even on roadways, if you can find them, that marsh might be a little healthier than the one next to it. Secondly, if I was a hunter out here setting traps, I can use this and all of this to my advantage. First off, I could use the base of this big old dogwood to anchor my trap. Secondly, I can set my trap right there because I know that they've been active here. The soil is still moist. It's still coming up quite rich. And they're going to come up through that and come up and mark their territory. Now, if I've already caught a beaver before, I'll actually take this. And this technique I learned from a gentleman from North Carolina originally. I think he lives in New Mexico now. This trick is quite simple. You have some glycerin with you, and you catch a beaver just using a blind trail. Just simple snare, catch it. 
what you're going to do is when you're butchering that animal, you're going to take the castor glands out of it and you're just going to let them dry. Put them in your oven at the lowest possible setting or the pilot light, kind of like you do with jerky. Put them in the dehydrator. Put them, hang them up in the sun, whatever you want to do with those glands. When they get really dry, you can chop them up and grind them up into a powder. And you mix that up with your glycerin. And your glycerin, you can get it at a, at a pharmacy and get them at some convenience stores that have a little first aid section. Even some hardware stores carry it. And you're going to mix them together. And that castor oil, it's not the actual castor oil, but that castor mix, you can actually put a few drops, just a few, on one of these piles. And what's going to happen next, the next time the beavers are around here, they're going to smell that new beaver's castor, come charging up here to see who's invaded their territory. Beaver are very territorial. And so if you set your trap there, or in any other runs that you see around that pile, just set the traps on them, have them wide open, that's your bait, but it's actually a lure. That's your trick for bringing the animal into the trap. So I could just set up a big snare here that's just wide enough for a beaver's head to go through it and put a dr uh, trigger set to it with a log or a rock to drown the beaver inside the water. I could set another one here, a big wide snare right in here, maybe two of them, just to make sure it's not going to miss them. He'll go right through, catch, and this one probably wouldn't set to drown it as much as I would to hold the animal in place. And we just come back in and catch it. And this is the result of all those trees that were cut down. And you chewed away and the poles, as big as this and sometimes even bigger, and we hauled away for something very special. But something very special is what I'm standing on right now. We'll show you that in a moment. This is actually the lodge of the beavers. There's quite a few of them out here. There's one back behind me and a few more down the marshway. The reason that the beaver wanted this site is it's part dam and part den. They come in here on occasion. They don't really frequent it too much. This is actually where they're trying to damming in a culvert to keep it from pouring all the water out of the marsh. It's a little silly, but beavers just don't like to seem to have water rushing around them. They like the water level high, not very low, or even. So, a good idea, if you want to try and trap, is to break a dam open. Set a trap right in there and they'll come flying in to try and fix it. It doesn't always work, but if you're really, really desperate to catch beaver, It'll work. Now I'm sitting on a game trail here, which is not usually what you want to do as a hunter-gatherer setting traps. You don't want to be leaving your mark there by leaving your scent all over the place, but we're just here to examine sites. We're not here to actually set some traps. It's the wrong season for me to personally want to go out and catch an animal that's a fur-bearing mammal. However, I'm here to examine a few things and I want to point out something. We've been looking at a lot of different trails and tracks. A lot of people think that it's going to be fixated on one animal. You're going to find a deer trail and you're just going to be following a deer trail. That's just not the case. You're going to find a lot of animals frequenting the same tracks, the same trails. This is a perfect example. See, this is a beaver trail. This is going from the water up onto the mainland up here. And the cool thing about this spot is it's well over a meter wide, which tells you two things. Either the animal's really big, that's a pretty big beaver, or it's frequented a lot and he's going all over the place, which is more likely the case. But as we look at it, the really cool thing about this spot is it's frequented by a lot of animals. You see, here is evidence that it's a beaver trail. Chewed right there and left. This is a piece of, oh, not sure, I would probably tell that as a alternate leaf dogwood. Just from the size of it, from the variety of woods we have around here. That's what I would guess it is. Could be a maple even, but it's unlikely as the branches aren't coming off the same places. So I would say one of the big alternate leaf dogwoods we have around this part of the forest. You can see his perfect bite marks and incisor marks. There's one of his tooth marks, another tooth mark there, 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 there. Chewed it off and just tossed it away after taking off all the bark. I'll just push back some of this debris and look down. Fine. Ah, there we go. We have this big shiny piece of a mussel shell. Now, the funny thing is, a lot of people think beavers and their relatives are just herbivores. It's not the case. Beavers usually frequently are, but a close relative of theirs isn't. That relative is the muskrat, who love and I really do mean love mussels. They also love cattail. They will frequently 
eat at sites like this. And muskrat is a good feed. It's a, not a small animal. It's a good sized critter. It'll get you a good little meal. And the furs are nice. They're fairly waterproof, so it's a nice little fur hat can be made out of it. Uh, fur implements are very, very nice, especially in the cold weather if you're living self-reliant in the wilderness. One of my favorite kinds of sites to find while tracking is resting sites. We've looked at feeding sites, we've looked at trails, but one of my favorite kinds is resting sites. This one's left by a white-tailed deer. You can tell just by the immense size of it. Now here would be where the rump was, down there, the hind leg, up there is where the head, shoulders, the front legs were. And you see the body shape. You can almost see it perfectly here. It's perfectly implanted in the grass. What I like about them, especially in the wintertime, the great thing about in the wintertime when you're tracking is first off, you can find tracks anywhere. Secondly, the fact that when you do find a resting site, the body heat of that animal will often melt the snow around them. And through the nighttime, it'll start to chill again. And by morning, some of their hair is frozen right there to the snow. And first off, you're going to find this beautiful imprint, just showing you the muscle tone of the animal, showing you the tail where it was, everything about the animal right there in the snow. As well, that hair is stuck to the snow so that when the animal pulls up, some of the hair will remain. You can really get to know that animal intimately. When you can find the hairs or the feathers of the animal, you're dealing with the animal itself now. You're no longer just looking at what it left behind, but a part of it.